friend, old Steve here. And Lars. The world of pro wrestling is filled with divisive, polarizing personalities that drive wedges in the wrestling community. Some people love them, some people hate them, but they always get fans in the wrestling world talking. So here are the top 10 most controversial wrestling personalities. Number 10. Eric Bischoff. Depending on who you are, you either think Eric Bischoff is the genius behind wrestling's greatest faction of all time, the NWO, or you think Bischoff is a blowhard who stole the idea for the greatest faction of all time and was responsible for running WCW into the ground. In fact, both these things are probably true, but the former president of WCW is still one of the most outspoken voices in wrestling and his aggressively unapologetic take on his version of history can be captivating and infuriating to wrestling fans. I'll be honest, I was cautiously optimistic when he was brought on as SmackDown's executive director just recently. I figured, hey, if he keeps up with the product, maybe a fresh perspective could help the show. I never really share that optimism. I said it was cautious optimism. From what I can tell, not only had he not kept up with the product, allegedly all he did was hire a writer who had worked on Sons of Anarchy, who allegedly fell asleep on a couch in the WWE headquarters break room. Yeah, sadly, due to that writer's alleged lack of sufficient slumber, we never got to see which wrestlers formed a motorcycle faction, because if there's one thing we know that is true, it's Eric Bischoff loves motorcycles. I'm hoping it was NWO Eric Rowan. Oh, he's the leader of new motorcycle gang? Yeah. Whatever happened to that guy? The new wheel order. There. That was bad. Number nine. Dave Meltzer! Why do wrestling fans obsess over the Wrestling Observer's match star ratings? Why is it the opinions of one man carry so much weight in the world of wrestling fandom? Maybe it's because Meltzer is at this point a veritable institution, Steve, with decades of wrestling observing, thousands upon thousands of pages of newslettering, and countless stars given to matches, solidifying his place as the only human to possess total, unified wrestling knowledge People hate when someone knows everything. And that's why Dave is so controversial, because he has such a vast bank of wrestling knowledge. When he expresses his opinion or offers up some speculation, wrestling fans and news sites alike cite it as near fact. We're as guilty as anyone, because Dave Meltzer, by and large, knows his shit. He's also not immune to getting shit very wrong, such as last year's reporting of Seth Rollins' Raw Raw locker room meeting, which, it turns out, didn't happen. But to borrow a familiar wrestling phrase, at the end of the day, most people who hate on Dave do so because his opinion matters more than theirs, and everyone wants their opinion validated, right? Yeah. In short, everyone wants to be the wrestling observer. Unfortunately for Dave's critics, there can only be one wrestling observer. They also don't like him because he's a bit of a Twitter troll. Nobody likes Twitter trolls, man. No. Number eight. The Click. Listen, Larson. What? Do I have a scoop for you? All right. The Click used to be a bunch of real assholes backstage during the early to mid 90s, politicking their way to the top at the expense of basically everyone else, leaving behind a tangled mess of resentment and hurt feelings. Actually, there's no scoop there. No scoop. Everybody knows that. The Click's backstage antics have been well documented over the years, Steve. No way, man. You heard it here first. The Click were jerks. You heard it here first. It's like the Scott Hall intro from the news brief. Yeah, despite their, shall we say, complex legacy backstage, no one can argue with what Kevin Nash, Scott Hall, Sean Waltman, Triple H, and Shawn Michaels did in front of the camera. They're all some of the most beloved wrestling personalities ever, and they've delivered some of the greatest in-ring performances in wrestling history. <laughs> I prefer the work they've done in front of RF video or U-shoot cameras. Whether it's X-Pac talking about ripping his butthole, or Kevin Nash busting out his whiteboard to get into the intricacies of booking Nitro and Thunder, these guys are like first ballot shoot interview Hall of Famers, man, and they don't seem to shy away from sharing all the sordid details of their exploits either. They know that controversy means cash. Have you actually bought any of these shoot interviews? I thought you just watched them all on YouTube. Yeah, man, I bought them all. All? Yeah, it's research. Number seven. Hulk Hogan. It had been well established long ago that the Hulkster built his legacy largely by being handpicked by Vince McMahon to be the foundation of WWF back in the early 80s and by being a masterful backstage politicker. This alone had many fans torn on the Hulkster, although many grew up idolizing him and may have been willing to look past his insistence on being the top guy wherever he went. Many, such as Vince Russo or Bret Hart, haven't been so willing. Now, if his outsized ego and arguably damaging creative control contractual clauses were the end of it, Hogan's legacy would have still been cemented as the most iconic pro wrestling figure ever responsible for some of the largest moments in WWF and WCW history. Unfortunately, real life reared its ugly head in two scandals resulting from a hidden camera sex tape 
created by his former friend, Bubba the Love Sponge, of Hogan and Bubba's wife doing the sex on each other in 2012. This resulted in a huge lawsuit Hogan filed against Gawker, which Hogan won. Yeah, fast forward to 2015, and another clip of that sex tape was leaked by the National Enquirer and Radar Online. This time, featuring a segment of Hogan making racist comments and using racial slurs. At one point, he even admits to being, quote, racist to a point. I don't know what that means. Shockingly though, this didn't sit well with WWE, who did their whole erase him from their past thing, which may have been easier with a wrestler who appears later on this list, <coughs> Chris Benoit, hmm. than it was with Hulk, because Hogan basically is the history of WWF. What made things even worse for Hulk was that when he did come back, word from the locker room was the apology he made to the roster was more about being caught than it was contrition for saying what he said in the first place. Yeah, man, his new motto is, say your prayers, eat your vitamins, do what you want, brother, but don't get caught. What you gonna do when hidden cameras run wild on you? I'm the man. Cotton. Is that a is that a hidden camera? Yeah, caught in hidden camera. <laughs> Number six. Vince Russo! Depending on who you are, you either think Vince Russo is the genius behind wait a second. What? This is this is literally the same way the Eric Bischoff entry started, man. Oh, well, that's because the parallels between Bischoff and Russo are plentiful. They both were credited with coming up with some really good ideas during the Monday Night War. They're both credited with coming up with some really bad ideas during the Monday Night War. They're both credited for being the reason WCW failed. They were both on TV far too much. The list just goes on and on. Yeah, and apparently so. The biggest difference between the two of them, though, besides the fact that Russo was an actual WCW Hold champion... Up. So was Eric Bischoff. He was the hardcore champion briefly. Really? Yeah. Jesus. Okay, so fine. The other biggest difference is their approach communicating with the wrestling community of today. Bischoff has his 83 Weeks podcast and is generally a pretty mild presence with fans, whereas Russo, uh, not so much. He literally has a segment on his show called Castrating the Marks, where he takes dirt sheet writers like Dave Meltzer to task for their takes, bro! Well, like everyone else on this list, Russo has his diehard believers and his diehard detractors, and in his mind, that's probably exactly how he likes it. Tell me, Steve, where do you fall on Vince Russo? Uh, it seems like he had some really cool ideas back in the Attitude Era, like, for example, the Brawl for All. Bro, let's try to kill some careers by seeing which one of these guys can really fight, bro. And then we'll have Butterbean come in and destroy the winner. So literally no one under contract with us gets anything from it. That's just genius, man. What about you? Firmly down the middle, on one hand, he made himself WCW champion and booked WCW into the ground. On the other, he was probably responsible for writing all the cool stuff that Stone Cold did at its peak, and he probably had a heavy hand in writing my favorite pay-per-view of all time, Survivor Series 98, Deadly Games. Like I like to say, people are complex. Bro. Bro. Number five. Ultimate Warrior! I don't think WWE has ever treated any one single superstar to as healthy a dose of revisionist history more than Ultimate Warrior. They literally made what amounts to a beef mixtape blasting Warrior with the self-destruction of the Ultimate Warrior DVD 10 years before they turned around and gave him the full legend treatment right before his death in 2014. But they went way past legend treatment though. They created the annual Warrior Award in his name for people who have super inspirational stories, which is great and all, but he's like, the least inspiring person in wrestling history, and we don't mean to speak ill of the dead, but... But Warrior was a bit of a dickhead while he was alive, people! He's the only person I know who publicly victim-blamed the victims of Hurricane Katrina. How do you victim-blame hurricane victims? Okay. That's not all, though. No, he bitched about Martin Luther King Jr. having a national holiday. He made some horrendous homophobic remarks and mocked Bobby Heenan when he got cancer. And yet, WWE made good with him, put him in the Hall of Fame, and named an award after him. And people will still defend Warrior despite all that. Anyways, you want to know how big of an indomitable dickhead Warrior was? There's a great deadspin write-up of him from around the time of his death. We'll put the link in the description. Yeah, you can read about the workout kit he tried to pedal. The Warrior Workout! But here's the thing. What? There were no workouts. What? It was just an audio recording of 75 minutes, over an hour, of Warrior yelling at you, along with a 10-page essay instructing you to spend three hours doing nothing 
to get your exercise head right. Like meditate? I don't know. How can you meditate when a guy's just yelling? I don't know. If I'm gonna do a crazy wrestler's workout, give me Freakzilla Scott Steiner's workout DVD. It's just three women watching him lift ungodly amounts of weight and no instruction beyond him yelling at you to push past any pain you may experience is truly indomitable. I don't even know what the fuck that word means. Same as undebeatable. Yeah, this is made up shit from him. Number four, four. Jim Cornette! For some reason, the man who seemingly has the most extensive knowledge of pro wrestling history ever also has a raging, seething hatred for anything new or interesting in pro wrestling. And because of that, has amassed a legion of fans with a similar dislike of new and cool shit. Jim Cornette is much like Dave Meltzer in that wrestling fans hang on every word they have to offer about wrestling today. In the case of Jim Cornette, however, it's usually to see how much he'll hate on whatever Kenny Omega, the Young Bucks, or Joey Ryan are doing. Uh, he has this antiquated notion that wrestling has to be presented like a real fight or else the business will be exposed and wrestling will die forever. Yeah, we're not sure if anyone has told Jim, though, that Wrestling was exposed as not real fighting decades ago, mm -hmm. and that variety has the ability to expand the audience of professional wrestling. True. Actually, we are sure because people tell him that all the time on Twitter, and then he blocks them, like he did with our friend Brian Zane. Yeah, that was a sad day because Brian and Jim had worked together on some videos, but Brian is a great guy, and Jim just comes off like a dick, so whatever, fuck him, goodbye. Whoa, whoa, be careful, man. What? That's like really close to his signature catchphrase. If we use his catchphrase, he might sue us. Yeah. Like he's suing the guy who made a shirt that says, fuck Jim Cornette. You know what, Cornette should be more concerned about that dry cough you always have. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Jeez, you get that man. checked out, Jim. Number three. Fabulous Moolah. The most decorated woman's champion in history also holds the most disturbing record of allegations of anyone in wrestling history. Allegations of exploitation, abuse, and even sexual trafficking have been levied at Moolah complicating her status as a legend in pro wrestling. There's a whole episode of Dark Side of the Ring that does her story and the story of her accusers justice, but the short version is Mula, real name Mary Ellison, spent decades exploiting trainees at her school, controlling every aspect of their lives and making them pay not just fees for training, but gouging them for rent, food, travel, to the point that some of the wrestlers under her tutelage spent years under Moolah before they made a single dime. Yeah, some of the most disturbing allegations were that Moolah was essentially a sex trafficker, that she pimped out her wrestlers to other promotions for their male wrestlers to have sex with, and if the women refused, they were raped. The family of Sweet Georgia Brown claimed this, as have other wrestlers like Ida Martinez and Penny Banner. Other wrestlers have come forward in Moolah's defense, it's just a shame that her legendary career seems to be built on the backs of so many others. And of course, all these allegations led to the WWE to honor Moolah by naming the WrestleMania Women's Battle Royal after her. It took two days of outcry and probably the threat of sponsors pulling out for them to reverse course and not name it after anyone. Seems like a matter of time before WWE starts just rewarding straight up criminals by naming shit after them. The Zodiac Killer Memorial Championship, Larson. The Charles Manson Humanitarian Award. The Chris Benoit Trophy for Family Values. Oh, Jesus. Speaking of Chris Benoit. Number two. Chris Benoit. One question we get a lot here at Going In Raw is, hey, Steven Larson. Yeah? Does Chris Benoit deserve to be in the Hall of Fame? The answer is obviously. No. Yeah, right, because he totally murdered his family. If we were somehow able to separate the man in the ring from the monster, then yeah, his career is easily worth of celebration. So the broader question is, should we be able to talk about the man we saw on TV without the burden of talking about his actions that ended his own life and the life of his son and wife? It's a valid one, and it's probably something uh, best left to the individual. Yeah, the WWE, on the other hand, has decided firmly to erase the crippler from history. His name is nowhere to be found on their website or on the network, save for the actual footage of the shows he was on. For example, when searching for a Benoit match on any given episode of Nitro from, say, 1997, just look at the segment listing for any match that lists a wrestler being involved in singles action, and chances are you found yourself a Benoit match. Yeah, he's so blacklisted, they won't even make it easy for you to find his matches. You have to be Sherlock Holmes to deduce what match he's in. It's not surprising, though, the murder-suicide he committed shocked everyone in the wrestling industry and changed everything overnight. Yeah, even Vince seemed rattled by the Benoit tragedy, and he no-sells seemingly everything. Well, speaking of which... Number one! Vince McMahon! It's a bit shocking that the pro wrestling business, an entire multi-billion dollar industry, 
has been formed and molded based on the increasingly dramatic whims of one 74-year-old lover of snow cones and farts. But here we are, speculating on a day-to-day -day basis what Vince has in store for the creative direction of the stories we're addicted to every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, sometimes on Sundays. And sometimes Thursdays, too. Sometimes Thursdays. More than that, though, Vince has crafted the industry based on his cutthroat approach to life. From driving his competition out when he killed the territories in the 1980s and then drove his competition out when he bought WCW in 2001, Vince McMahon is pro wrestling for better or worse. And of course, everything he does is put under a microscope. Every move he makes is taken apart and analyzed. Every wrestling angle is viewed through the lens of, well, this is what Vince wants to do apparently. Yeah, he's an intriguing, confounding, and perplexing figure. Like I say, people are complex. And one that has been more divisive than anyone else on this list combined. He also thinks farts are hilarious, and sneezing should be basically a federal crime. Um, if stories are to be believed, we should do an entire top 10 list on just weird Vince stories alone. That's not a terrible idea. Oh crap, hold on. My phone's ringing over uh -oh. here. Is he... oh. oh no, it's Vince. Hi, Hi Vince. Vince. Are you two idiots talking about me? I can smell that you're talking about me. Who else did you talk about? Russo? Bischoff? I hate Bischoff. He hired a guy who fell asleep in the break room. I hate sleep. You want to know the longest I've ever slept in a night? Just Three and a half hours. hours. And that's only because I was sick. It only yeah. happened once. Uh, so anyways, uh, be sure to give this episode a like. Leave us what you think in the comments. And then uh, uh, look at these videos here. We got the, the last week's and the, week, the, the other still one. Here. Still here too. He's still talking right now. So yeah, we'll talk to you guys later. Bye. This goes on and on, doesn't it? It doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. It doesn't stop.